once again, uh, very welcome uh, to this evening's webinar uh, on Pathway to First Study, uh, just to, as our speakers will highlight their journey from undergraduate uh, to a postgraduate doctorate, uh, PhD, and their projects and research on the area of sustainable manufacturing research, which is a really interesting area uh, that I was fortunate enough to hear a bit of it a few weeks ago. So I'm really glad that they'll be able to hear a lot more uh, this evening, and I hope that you enjoy it. Um, so just then um, for you to note um, that if you, when you are watching this, uh, this would count as one of your CPDs, so continue professional development. So this is very important uh, for especially our graduate engineers and members uh, to log their CPD uh, as they work towards uh, maybe uh, uh, their professional ties in the future, uh, but also to keep your ongoing development uh, obviously, if you're a student member, uh, you don't need to, to log this, uh, but obviously, if you want to keep notes yourself and to see the different areas that you are uh, getting further knowledge and developing in, this will all be done uh, to your membership dashboard. Um, and obviously, for those who are probably are graduating pretty soon, it's now, uh, I guess, September. I'm sure graduation will be coming up in October, November time for some of our graduate members. Uh, just reminded that you do need to transfer your student membership uh, to graduate membership um, uh, and continue to receive the benefits of Engineers Ireland membership. And again, uh, you can do that uh, through your membership dashboard, as you can see there, uh, by clicking on become a full member. Um, and then from there, uh, all you need to do is uh, uh, fill out the application form and put in a few details uh, so that we have the information up to date. Um, later on, then you'll be contacted to submit your, uh, your transcripts and qualifications for verification. Um, and then once we have that information, then you can apply the post-nominal MIEI, so member of the Institute of Engineers Ireland, to show that you have now had your qualica qualification verified, you're a full member of Engineers Ireland, you can continue to receive the benefits of membership, including a discounted rate uh, for the first four years of membership. Um, so, of course, if there's any questions at all in terms of Engineers Ireland uh, membership or anything at all uh, coming out of this presentation, do feel free to get in contact uh, with us, um, obviously by phone. Our offices are now uh, more open uh, during the week. So again, you can pop in if you are in Dublin at our office on 22 Clyde Road, uh, but also uh, our email and phone number there. Um, so we have two speakers this evening uh, join us. So I'll just briefly introduce uh, the first speaker, uh, which is Emma, uh, who's a PhD student in, in the University of Limerick. Um, so she's gonna go through a uh, bit of her background uh, in engineering and, uh, of course, then her, her research area on uh, air on structures and materials. So very interesting. Uh, welcome. Uh, thanks, and Emma, for speaking this evening. And then she'll be followed then afterwards uh, by Gia, uh, who's a PhD student in Queen's University, Belfast, um, also. So I'll uh, call on then uh, Emma uh, to uh, kick us off then this evening. Um, so, as Pierre said, my name is Emma Tobin. I am a PhD student here in the Bernal Institute. Um, so I'm just going to briefly, really briefly talk about my journey to engineering, how I got into research and what I'm doing now. So I grew up in a family of engineers with both of my grandparents, be, both of my grandfathers being engineers, one of them being an engineer in the ESB and the other starting up his own engine, precision engineering company. Um, so you sp I suppose you could say I always grew up around an engineering mindset. So I say my interest in engineering probably started there. Like I suppose the majority of soon to be engineers, I grew up playing with Lego, Meccano, Connects. I was really lucky that my family always facilitated that and always brought me to look at cool planes and cool cars. So I suppose that's where that interest always started. And it grew and grew from there. With the growth of that interest came my degree, so I did my an integrated master's in aeronautical engineering in the University of Limerick, and I graduated in 2020, which really wasn't a great idea to, or a great time to come out with a degree in aviation, but that's fine. And um, the degree itself, I really enjoyed, and we got to do some really interesting modules, uh, including the flight lab. So we get specialized aircraft sent over from the University of Cranfield. And we can monitor what's going on with the aircraft in real time. And we also get to do modules like the design, build, fly, where we design, build and fly our own RC aircraft. And um, during all engineering degrees within UL, we also get the opportunity to take part in a co-op, so cooperative education. 
I was lucky enough to get to do mine in Liebherr Aerospace Lindenberg, so in the south of Germany. While I was there, I was a testing engineer, so I was working on testing of large scale um, landing gear, both nose and rear gear, as well as their subcomponents. The work itself was really, really interesting. I enjoyed the testing element of it, but I realized not long into it that I wasn't that interested in working in landing gear itself. But that made me kind of realize that I didn't know what I wanted to do post degree. So I kind of made a promise to myself to look into other areas within the airspace industry to find out what it was I was really interested in. So that's how I ended up working for a three month internship in Vortex Aviation in Shannon, where it's a aircraft propulsion MRO facility, so maintenance, repair and overhaul. And again, my it was really, really interesting. I just wasn't necessarily interested in maintenance, repair and overhaul. And uh, my main role was uh, document control, so ensuring that all of the relevant work was being done to the engines that we had in house. After the summer of working in Vortex, I got to take my first module in composites. Um, and that's kind of where I got introduced to composites and how I that's how I decided that that's where I wanted to do my master's focusing in it. So I got the opportunity to work, do a three month summer bursary in, here in UL and I was working on a European Space Agency funded project. And the whole idea of the project was to show that we could use advanced materials. So this was a carbon fiber peak composite with an advanced manufacturing system. So laser assisted automated tape placement to show that the, the, two, the combination was suitable for space application. Um, and this was my first introduction to research. And it was the first time I really felt excited about what I was doing because everything was changing regularly. And there was a load of problem solving and there was a lot of networking between different companies as well as different people within my research group. So that's kind of how I decided that I wanted to go into a more research-based path and how I decided to focus my master's in aerospace grade material and structures. So my master's work on the toughening of carbon fiber peak composites. I was really lucky that actually some of my work ended up getting published by my supervisor, as well as one of the lads here doing their PhD. Um, so that was really, really good. I ended up then doing a year as a research assistant here in UL, working on high sensitivity pressure and temperature sensors um, made from fiber optic cables. And it was during this time I decided that, yes, I wanted to do a PhD. And that's how I ended up here in the Varicomp group. So the whole idea of Varicomp is to develop advanced composites and subsequent, subsequent structures with variable properties that change uh, the performance characteristics. And um, I'm working under the supervision of Professor Paul Weaver and Dr. Ronan O'Higgins. Um, so what actually is my research? So I'm working on the development of a sustainable wind turbine blade um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of background as to why I'm working on that area and how blades are currently manufactured. So I suppose as many people here know, there's been a global push for renewable energy sources. And with that comes an increase in prevalence in wind turbines and wind energy. And we can see from the graph there that wind energy capacity has been increasing steadily throughout the last 20 years. With this growth in wind energy, though, comes an increase in composite waste with blades having a, an expected lifetime of 20. 20 to 25 years. Um, so with the current trajectory of um, wind energy capacity, as well as the expected lifetime, they're expect it's expected that there will be about 40 million tons of global composites waste. Um, so that's kind of how the idea formed. So before I get into what I'm doing, I'll give you what's currently being done. So current wind turbine blades, I'll talk about the manufacturing as well as the material. So largely, Wind turbine blades are manufactured with a glass reinforced, reinforced thermo set. It's a cheap and cheerful material and it's more than suitable for what we're trying to use it for. The issue though is due to a lack of financial reason as well as low energy efficiency or low energy recovery, they're very rarely recycled. So these generally end up in landfill. The manufacturing method used for wind turbine blades is vacuum assisted resin transfer molding. I'll call it Vartum from here on in. Um, it's a high, um, it's a labor intensive process and it's time intensive because all of those glass fiber sheets are laid by hand. And as you can see in that picture there, there's a lot of bagging film, there's a lot of tubing and all of that is done by hand. Similarly, the infusion process itself takes a significant amount of time. 
And all of those tubes, those bags, the tacky tape is a one and done component. So they are all sent to landfill post processing as well. So that opens up the question of how do we ensure that this green source of energy is really and truly green from material and manufacturing? What can we do? So that opens the question of what is a green wind turbine blade? And in my opinion, and from the research that I've done so far, the following statements can be made. So the material used needs to be environmentally friendly, so that that be recyclable or biodegradable. The manufacturing has to be low waste as well, so that way we're not having that high level of consumables going to landfill. Um, in order to make sure it's really and truly sustainable, we should probably use a low energy manufacturing method. But in order for this to be a viable substitution in industry, this needs to be the same price, if not a lower cost to manufacture than current blades. So then how do we do that? And that's where my work is focusing. So I'm posing the question that we should change both the material and the manufacturing methods used to manufacture these large scale structures. So I suggest that we move away from the glass fiber reinforced thermosets towards a biocarbon based thermoplastic polymer. So when I say biocarbon, what I mean is something like a lignin derived uh, carbon fiber. Lignin is a byproduct of the paper making industry or using recycled carbon fiber, something like that. And the reason for this is the combination of thermoplastic as well as a carbon fiber, let that be bio or recycled, um, is we get a really high strength and stiffness component at the end of it. That facilitates this increase in length of wind turbine blades, which allows them to be more efficient at the end, more efficient. Thermoplastics, due to the polymer, the lack of polymer cross-linking, are readily reformable. So that means at the end of the blade life, they can be reformed into something new so it doesn't need to go to landfill. Similarly, they're somewhat easier to recycle. Um, despite the higher cost of thermoplastics and these biofibers, they are lower cost to manufacture with. So that kind of ticks off one of the boxes of it being of the these new blades needing to be low cost. Um, and similarly, the use of thermoplastic facilitates the use of something of out of all blade manufacturing methods. For example, laser assisted um, automated tape placement or LATP, and that's the machine that we see there in the picture. So why should we use LATP? Well, as I've mentioned, it's already an automated system. So we significantly reduce the associated labor costs of blade manufacturing. Similarly, it's one of the most energy efficient methods of manufacturing, which is another one of the statements for green energy or a green wind turbine blade. Uh, studies in house have shown that you can manufacture complex geometries. So we're not limited to the shape or the size of these blades. Um, and we can manufacture really structurally efficient blades. So we're using as low amount of material as we need in order to make sure we're not reducing any of the material, uh, component qualities. Um, LATP in its simplest form is a localized rapid heating of composite tape through a laser. And the laser uh, is absorbed by the carbon fibers within the tape. That energy is stored in terms of heat and that heat is conducted to the matrix, causing the matrix to melt. Um, it's a really rapid heating process about, we're talking like hundred degrees per second. Consolidation, Pressure is applied via a compaction roller, so that acts to stick plies together. So it's a really novel um, manufacturing technology, and it seems really great. It seems really simple that we have heat, we have pressure, we stick two plies together, and it's brilliant, and it's automated, and it's wonderful. But that's not necessarily the case. It's a really, really novel manufacturing method, so that means there's always room for more research. And the area of research that's still kind of lacking right now is the interdependencies between the process parameters and the overall component quality, um, specifically the, the link between all the parameters. So for argument's sake, the placement rate, so the rate that we place the tape down on the mandrel significantly in, influences the process temperature, controlling what the maximum temperature in the tape is. That in turn influences the matrix viscosity, so how well that matrix flows across the boundaries, which then influences the amount of consolidation pressure that we need. The consolidation pressure directly influences the void content and the, vo the bond quality between plies. And if they aren't up to par, so if we have too many voids or we don't have a good enough bond, we have to go back to the start and change the placement rate. And then that cycle starts again. So that's the issue that we're facing right now with ATP. The aim is to get a component that we like what we see here on the right hand side of the screen, where we have relatively low void, relatively even fiber distribution and decent bond quality. That's the aim. That's the standard we were wanting to get. But with ATP, it's very, very common to get 
a quality that a component that looks a little bit more like this. So we can see significant amount of void. We see a lot of resin rich spots and fiber dry spots, which is what not what we want. And that's where my research is focused from now on in is to determine what's causing these voids to grow and how can we reduce that and make sure that we're able to manufacture large scale components like wind turbine blades um, rapidly, but also make sure that we're not compromising the component quality. So that's kind of the summary of what I did and what I'm doing now and what I hope to go on to do. But um, if any of you are considering going on to do a PhD or have just started, I do have a little bit of advice about, you know, just the process itself. And um, the PhD process is a journey. There are going to be ups and downs. Um, your project title is going to change. Your line of work is going to change. The people that you're working with will change as well. One way to make this a little bit easier is to have a serious interest in the area in which you're working. Those downs are a lot worse when you're not interested in what you're doing. Um, make sure that you work hard and do good work. And a lot of that will speak for itself. And that's going to get your name out there. You're going to have more people who want to work with you, which is always beneficial when you're in a PhD. And I know I said, let your work speak for itself, but you also have to do a significant amount of promoting your own work. If you're not promoting your own work, who else is going to do it and why should they? So if you get the opportunity to speak in schools or speak in conferences, or if Engineers Ireland ask you to talk, you take the opportunity and you run with it. And all of this is beneficial in terms of growing your research network. Your research network is what you're going to need to be able to get a job at the end of your PhD or help you write grant proposals or, you know, just be able to have people who you can bounce ideas off of and grow that network. But yeah, that's everything I have to say. Um, thanks for listening. And if you have any questions, I'll answer them at the end. Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Emma. That was, that was really great. Um, great overview on the journey you took uh, to get um, to that research. Um, and thanks, yeah, those, that advice uh, also is really helpful. Um, so thanks for that. Um, so now I pass over to Gia, uh, if you want to get your presentation ready and yeah, take it away when you are. Uh, yes, thanks, Pierce. I'm trying to, uh, to share my screen. So give me a second. Um, yes, uh, so can everybody see it now? Uh, my screen? Yeah, it's all good, yeah. Uh, okay, good. Uh, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, maybe it's a bit late now, but uh, no, with great pleasure and honor, I'd like to uh, thank the Engineers Island for giving this opportunity, uh, you know, to share and uh, talk about um, some of my experience, like study and research on the sustainable manufacturing and uh, you know the goal is to mainly give an overview of my my own PhD journey and hopefully can help you know to solve some of your confusions uh, you might have when considering pursuing your own PhD. Uh, so I'd like to uh, start with uh, a brief uh, introduction of myself. Uh, so I'm currently a PhD student at Queen's University Belfast, and I got my Bachelor of Engineering degree in 2019 from the Northwestern Polytechnic University, China. Uh, when I was studying in, you know, NPU, uh, it is a typical uh, university works on the uh, aeronautics and astronautics. Then I started my 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 study in the field of uh, aircraft manufacturing. And when I was studying NPU, I had opportunity you know, to be involved as an international student ambassador, uh, mainly working together with international exchange students from all over the world. Uh, it's really a good experience uh, at that time to help the international students to get used uh, to the living, study, and culture environment in China. And through this experience, I have really learned a lot about, uh, you know, different culture. And uh, uh, very importantly, I have the opportunity to improve my English a lot, which really helped uh, a lot uh, and made me uh, well prepared, at least with language, when I was uh, applying for a PhD in the future. And uh, then very likely during my undergraduate study in China, I had the opportunity uh, to participate in uh, through the fully funded exchange program. And one is in the University of South Denmark and another is in uh, uh, Peter the Great St. Petersburg University in Russia. Uh, 
this is first time I have experience uh, to really live and study in a, another country and learn how to work as a team and to collaborate, also play a role in completing a project. Um, but the course I'm taking during these uh, programs are all mechanical engineering. So this has helped me to uh, you know, confirm my plan, maybe to pursue a future study in a foreign country in the engineering field. And also uh, in 20, uh, 2018, I had the one month internship at the AVIC Aircraft Corporation in China, uh, where I have experience to learn about uh, uh, aero structures, aircraft manufacturing and aircraft materials. And by this, I found my own interest in the aircraft structures manufacturing. And then I considered uh, to start about uh, a degree in this field, maybe. And then in 2019, after several talks to my current supervisor and also rounds of interview, I got this uh, APSRC funded studentship to pursue my PhD uh, at Queen's University Belfast in aerospace engineering, uh, with particular research focus on the aircraft manufacturing engineering. And then I'm going maybe to talk a bit about uh, uh, what I'm currently doing for my, my own PhD project. Uh, I believe uh, most of us knows like uh, with interesting amount for uh, decarbonization, the aviation industry has used around uh, a 50% lightweight carbon fiber composite as Ima has just uh, talked about. Um, there are mainly thermal set carbon fiber epoxy composites uh, for the current generation aircraft and uh, the carbon fiber epoxy showed good property. Uh, it has uh, almost the same strengths, but there's only one third density of metals. However, this uh, material has definitely brings about uh, some concerns on the repairing and recycling of such material at the end of the airplane's service life. And they cannot be remelted or shaped, you know, due to the, the thermal set nature of the such material. Then people have uh, uh, develop normal the thermoplastic materials, for example, the thermoplastic uh, pack composite. <clears throat> the thermoplastic pack has been developed, uh, you know, to fabricate a new composite with carbon fiber, as the pack can soften and even melt when heated. This has made the reprocessing and the recycling of such material uh, really much easier, <clears throat> which can contribute uh, to the reduction of a carbon emission in the aviation industry. Uh, through its good recyclability and the repairability. And uh, so for my project, we mainly focus on the manufacturing of such uh, thermoplastic uh, uh, structures, but we focus on the aircraft assembly. And during assembly, the whole making is key manufacturing process. Uh, however, we can see the whole damage can be easily induced, which causes 6% of part uh, rejections and it deteriorates uh, the performance of the aircraft. And currently in the literature, a drilling of conventional carbon fiber epoxy composites is well studied. However, uh, the study on the novel carbon fiber pack drilling is quite limited. So my project aims to uh, directly address this challenge by reviewing the whole damage mechanism during drilling of such carbon fiber pack composites and also improve the whole quality through the optimization of drilling conditions, methods, and parameters. And this can potentially help to achieve sustainability in future aviation industry uh, by two ways. First is by using a more sustainable materials. And the other way is help to improve the manufacturing quality and the, to avoid part rejection during the manufacturing process. And uh, our work on the whole making of novel sustainable carbon fiber pack composites has led to some relevant research output uh, with four journal papers published uh, on high impact journals, including the top journals in the field of composite materials. And also we have like four conference presentations at international influential conferences uh, with four conference awards or grants from professional bodies like uh, IET, IMACE, and uh, the Royal Aeronautical Society. And very luckily for the work I'm currently doing with my PhD project, uh, I have got the uh, IET postgraduate awards as one of the six uh, recipients globally 
uh, which is established uh, to encourage the next generation of uh, engineers innovation. And also at the same time, I had the opportunity uh, to participate in some of the outreach event at local schools, you know, to talk about my research and talk about what we're currently doing and uh, to raise the awareness of sustainability uh, for our young generation. Uh, I know that many of our audience might be considering pursuing a PhD in the future. So uh, I might have some, uh, you know, some small advice maybe from my own experience from my site. Um, so before starting a, a PhD, you might have some confusions, like whether I'm going to do this, do I really like this? I think it's very important. Uh, you really need to ask yourself two questions. So do I really enjoy doing research? Maybe I can tell this from my previous experience. And is a PhD really necessary for my own career goal? You know, it's, uh, it's four years of your life you put uh, both time and efforts onto that. And finishing a PhD is never an easy way. So getting a PhD, um, you know, is not the route to make lots of money or even gaining any prestige. It is only the basic, uh, I mean, required degree for most uh, academic or research positions. And also it's an um, apprenticeship to learn like how we can start to do research and after graduating as PhD student, uh, you're supposed to you know, grow up as a mature uh, independent researcher, also thinker and writer. Uh, that's the way of doing a PhD. So before starting a PhD, uh, take careful thought about uh, your goals and uh, uh, your preference. And also, so once you confirm yourself, okay, I like doing research and I have the plan to work in the uh, academia or research institutions, you can then take the next step, trying to think what kind of work uh, I might prefer or I'm more good at. And different PhD projects can involve, you know, different types of work. For example, experiment-based lab working or some of them are mathematical modeling and some of them might you know, involve a lot of uh, coding things. And uh, so before starting a PhD, it's very important to clarify this. And it would be your daily work, you know, during the whole three to four years time. And, uh, but, you know, with the growing of many multidisciplinary projects, it often involves, you know, both experiment and modeling work, or even like me, like for a combination of three like this, both experiment, modeling, and coding. So, but it's always good to just have a thought about the types of work you're good at. And at the same time, uh, I would say be well prepared for potential some multidisciplinary problems you might be meeting with during your PhD journey. And also the, uh, uh, the research topics you're working on is also very important. And uh, I believe your C providers will also be along your side to discuss and guide you uh, to make sure the topics you are working on or you selected is the most uh, cutting edge technology in the field and uh, directly addresses the challenges or uh, fill in some of the knowledge gaps that needs to be urgently addressed. And uh, lastly, uh, the choice of countries and universities is also very important. Uh, you might have some preferred countries or universities to work in. Uh, might be because they have the most advanced research groups, most uh, advanced uh, facilities, or maybe a very interesting research project and topics you want to do. Um, in spite of this, uh, some of the different countries uh, have different policies, you know, towards the tuition fees and fundings. Uh, this, uh, this is something you might need to clarify before applying for that. Uh, I think especially for international students, you know, some of the fundings are only applicable for uh, some of local students or EU students. Uh, and the proportion of fundings available for international students is relatively lower. So you need to really keep an eye on that, uh, on every possible available positions that might appear on the website at different time of the year. So you need to really keep an eye on that and to keep a good track of that. Um, so once you step onto your PhD and uh, you know start your work, it comes to the next step, 
you know, to think about how I can improve the impact on my research. Uh, here I have listed maybe you can do that uh, through the three points. Uh, for example, firstly for industry. Um, so what's the potential, you know, future application of your technology and how your research can directly help industry to solve from problems. Uh, for example, for one of uh, the work I am currently doing with my PhD project, uh, I have developed the optimization algorithm to optimize uh, the whole quality uh, during the machining process of the error structures. And uh, with the algorithm we have developed, uh, we successfully helped uh, the aircraft manufacturer reduce the whole damage uh, by 40% and achieved the uh, you know, third body of improved uh, production efficiency. Uh, that's the industry application you need to think about. Um, and another point is uh, knowledge exchange and sharing. Uh, for example, uh, some research uh, dissemination at uh, high impact journals and conferences. And I think in the conference, you can have close interaction with some of the world leading uh, researchers in the field, and they might provide uh, very valuable feedbacks to your research work and help improve that. Uh, also, by attending the conference and giving oral presentation, uh, you can disseminate your work to a wide uh, audience and enhance your presentation and communication skills as well. Uh, it also can potentially you know, increase the impact of your work within your field of research and help you to build up your own uh, research profile. Uh, the wide range of topics at some of the great conferences can also help you to expand your knowledge and keep yourself updated with the latest development in your field and inspire your future research work. Uh, these are the very good points of uh, attending a conference. And also uh, uh, working closely with professional bodies uh, is very important. Uh, uh, for example, uh, Engineers Ireland, they have really a lot of uh, resources and events available uh, on the website. Uh, which have definitely benefited me a lot as from my side. And uh, this can help you to uh, to learn about your research field and also to, uh, to meet with some, some peer researchers, uh, which you can communicate and maybe establish some potential collaboration with each other. And uh, the last point, uh, I think very importantly, uh, don't forget to think about how your research can benefit the social well-being and address the human challenges. Uh, for example, sustainability, uh, some climate change, health lives, and the digital future, and so on. These are very important topics um, that can directly benefit social well-being and, uh, you know, help people really uh, solve the urgent problems. Uh, so uh, finally, I would like to acknowledge uh, the funding support from uh, UKRI and the H2020 framework for my PhD project. And uh, I would also like to thank IETI Mackey and uh, Royal Aeronautical Society uh, for the funding support for my conference grants uh, to support me attending the uh, conferences and uh, disseminate my research to the wide engineering community. And uh, also like thank my supervision team and uh, also thank Engineers Ireland again for giving this opportunity uh, to share and discuss my research and uh, I'm really glad to take any questions you might have. And if there are any questions, also feel free to contact me. Yeah, thank you very much. So yeah, thank you so much, uh, Gia, uh, for that. So it's, again, fantastic uh, presentation. Um, and again, thank you, uh, Emma. Uh, also, um, really have a couple of questions myself, but uh, I'll turn off uh, the record now. But I do want to say, um, again, thank you both for giving your time this evening uh, uh, and sharing your experience. Um, and also uh, parts of your research projects. So.